Thank you, Zoe. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I've been teaching at Anima since 2015 when I met Nick and uh, he wanted to give away the existential coaching and then I had pitched him we can do something about positive psychology because the meeting points between positive psychology and coaching they are plentiful and they are powerful and they have not really been explored to an extent that it's really established so it's a really interesting time to be involved because the science is only 20 years old which is nothing in science terms um, so it's a lovely field. There's so much research coming out and I, I'm taking that angle because I've done the MSc in positive, applied positive psychology in 2008. Um, so they just had started cohort two and I kind of slipped into it because, uh, well, I wanted to, uh, to study positive psychology, had heard about it, there was an undergraduate module. And then the module leader, I've asked, uh, hey, there's this one master's in the world in, uh, in Pennsylvania under Seligman. And she said, yeah, there's another one now here with me. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that then. Uh, so that's how I got into positive psychology and uh, then moved uh, into the Animite uh, region. And uh, it's just an amazing community. So for those of you who are just checking it out, uh, do stay, talk to people because you know these guys are amazing. And these kind of events, they really bring a community together. And I haven't seen that at any other school just in the way that you guys are doing it. So big up. Um, positive psychology, coaching for happiness. <laughs> happiness is uh, quite a fuzzy term, so I'm gonna be referring to it just for simplicity's sake. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of well-being and that's really kind of what I want to uh, guide you through tonight and um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about what's up there. Um, so a little bit about why happiness uh, at all, why should we care about happiness? Uh, why me, what can I tell you about that? Um, why coaching? Why coaching is such a, a good pathway or framework or process to actually facilitate increases in well-being and happiness. And uh, then what is coaching? Uh, just to kind of give it a frame because there's such a broad range and you'll find out why that matters as we go through it. Um, and then very importantly, well, what is happiness? Because if we don't understand what it is and the, it's a multifaceted construct, and there's so many, if you ask 20 people what happiness is, you probably get 20 different answers. Uh, if you ask 20 people what love is, you get similarly a range of answers. Uh, so it's important that we kind of uh, understand it in the first place so that we develop a language to actually figure out what does a client mean when they say, I want to be happier. You know, I, don't, I want to be more satisfied with my life. You know, um, what, wh what language do we have and what's the theory behind it? What's the science behind it? Um, then how can this look like in practice? There's a multitude of ways and there's no way I'm gonna get through all of the bullet points I've made there in the end, but I want to at least give you a little bit of a glimpse of a few bits and pieces of how it could be applied in the coaching room and also how you could apply it to yourself. And then how you can learn more. Um, I always put a bunch of resources and uh, further reading. I do like books, I like reading, uh, but there's also uh, very long YouTube playlists uh, all about positive psychology coaching. So I, um, yeah, there's a few slides. I'm, I'm happy to give you the slides afterwards. Not sure we distribute that, but I'm sure we can figure it out. Um, so that's at the end. But first of all, um, maybe just take a moment and then uh, turn to your neighbor or to your neighbors and uh, just Take a minute or two uh, to talk about these questions. What do you want out of life? What are your clients after? And what do you want most for your loved ones? And they might or might not be the same. So I just wanted you, to, you guys to kind of get in the mindset of what we're chasing. I'm gonna take part in your conversation, is that okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much everybody. If you could come back into the room with your mind and uh, I know it's all quite exciting and I love the, the energy and buzz every time 
Every time you drop happiness into a room and get people talking about it, exactly this happens. Nobody wants to stop talking about it. <laughs> um, I wasted lots of time talking about happiness. <laughs> but none of this is wasted. That's the thing. You know, uh, it is quite exciting and it is quite positive when we start bringing something into the room that we really enjoy and that invokes positive emotions. Um, it's actually, when we, when we do that for people and we, we consciously ask questions around positive things or about happiness or well-being, um, there's actually a lot of research behind that that's really good for the coaching room because people tend to be more creative when they, in, when they are induced happy states. You know, they're more present. Um, they, uh, in science terms, we say it broadens our thought action repertoires. So a bit more, more on that later, but um, we can use that strategically. That's why often in coaching, it's really useful when we say, um, tell me about your ideal life, you know, or let's, let, tell me about your dream or your vision or like the most positive life that you could imagine. You know, tell me something, tell me when you were at your best. Tell me something good, good about yourself. You know, we invoke positive emotions just by asking those questions and it gets people into a creative state. So we can, we can use those things. Um, have you noticed differences between these three questions? Were they the same? Do you want different things for yourself than your clients come for? Did you notice something different you want for your kids or siblings or friends that you want for yourself? Can we just throw a few things up? A few things that you wanted or clients wanted or you want for other people, just so we uh, grasp some of the elements of happiness. Purpose. Very good. What else? Variety. What's that? Variety. Variety. Say a bit more. Uh, so for me personally, what I want out of life is to have lots of different experiences. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, novelty. Yeah, I'm a, a blessing and a curse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very true. What else? Independence. Independence. Mm -hmm. Authenticity. Authenticity living in accordance with your values, your beliefs, right? Um, balance came up from Carl, that was, that was really cool. Um, what else? Health. Anything else that was unusual, maybe? So you hear what you kind of expected. Cool. Um, so my proposition is whatever we're after, Ultimately, in the end, if you keep asking the question, and if you had that, what would that do for you? And if you had a million pounds, what would that do for you? And if you had uh, good health, what would that do for you? Or if you've had that car or that friend or that job, you know, what usually clients often come for, I think the ultimate goal, the end goal, is always some form of happiness and well-being. So I'm gonna leave that there. I put that into your head. So we're gonna revisit that later. Uh, after we went through those well-being theories and given what you've just discussed with, with each other, I'm interested whether there's anything there that isn't covered by those theories, you know, whether there is some room for it. Because then we're all going to be thinking about what happiness actually means. And science is not the only thing, you know, there could be stuff that isn't in the theories, but it's actually relevant. You know, you mentioned balance. It isn't necessarily in the theories as a term, but maybe it'll come in there. So I, I want you to get you thinking about this kind of stuff. So I came into positive psychology uh, in 2008. Um, and I realized through studying it that uh, I've always kind of been quite upbeat and quite happy for at least as long as I can think. I think my, my mom might think differently about it. Apparently we had some fights or something. <laughs> but uh, I've heard, uh, like, uh, as I was uh, um, learning about positive psychology, I realized why I think I was quite happy and full of positive emotions for so long. There was a lot of things, a lot of strategies, a lot of aha moments in terms of ah, the conditions of my life are like this, that impacts my well-being, or I have this habit, or I do uh, this on a regular basis, and I think that really impacts my levels of well-being. So that was, that was really quite insightful, and I, I grew up in a family, I, I feel quite privileged in the family that I grew up in, because I actually had time to think about this kind of stuff. 
And uh, what happened after I turned 30, I felt an increasing urge to kind of give something back with all of that thinking and education that I had the time to actually do. So that's why I'm teaching a lot more and I'm writing and I'm working with a lot of coaches because I love the generative effect that this has. Because you can work with one person and it will affect them and the people in perhaps their family or their workplace. But if you work with a coach, you know, all of you are going to literally change dozens of lives a year, sometimes a month, sometimes a day. You know, and the generative effect that it has on the world, I think, is incredible. So it's, it's truly meaningful to me. And uh, I came into positive psychology, explored all of that space. Then, uh, as, as uh, Zoe mentioned, I went into existential coaching because I figured, well, a lot of uh, positive psychologists are actually way too positive for my taste. <laughs> um, I needed somebody to acknowledge and appreciate that life very often is really hard. It's challenging. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, it impacts you. There's a lot of anxiety because we're human beings in the world with other people. And that just like people get bored and some people are nasty and we have all of these things that we bring from our childhood. I needed somebody to acknowledge that. It's so much more useful than I had ever dreamed of to identify your strengths or create purpose or start with the end in mind, you know, work solution focused. But we can't just ignore the stuff that isn't working well. So I just wanted kind of to put that in there. Um, balance is important to me, integration is important to me, and you will hear probably an existential edge to my narrative. Um, but what I want to do today, uh, I give you a little bit of a word at the end about uh, the next wave of positive psychology that includes more of the darker sides of life. Um, but that's how I came in here with. And I must say it's a real joy to work with clients from that paradigm. Because, as I mentioned, you start with what's right with you, not what's wrong with you. And for some people, it's a, it's a real awakening because they're so stuck in, in going to see a coach or going to see a friend, going to see a therapist, going to see a family member and just kind of talk about all the things that are wrong. And if you then break that cycle and you just ask what's right with them, you know, what, what, are, they, what are they good at? You know, what are they proud of? What are they, what are they doing well? What went well in the last 24 hours? You know, tell me three things that went well today. You know, it's, it, for some people it really gets them out of their paradigm and it has a huge effect on clients. So if you start coaching work like that, it's a joy. You know, because you start with joy. You get people to imagine their best self and then they can chase that. You know, and there's lots of evidence-based uh, approaches and interventions and exercises that we can actually do with that. Um, there's a lot more to me, but I don't really think that, I mean, as coaches we know a relationship uh, is important. The more, the better our relationship is, the more you learn. But um, I'll skip the story because we have limited time and I have a lot to tell you about and I like theory. So uh, let's move on. Um, there is a recent podcast uh, where somebody uh, interviewed me about my journey into positive psychology. So if you want to know more, uh, you'll, you'll find that. So why happiness? Well, it feels good. Yeah, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, and actually we know now, I mentioned the broaden and build theory of uh, Barbara Fredrickson, we know it can uh, undo negative emotions. You know, positive and negative I always have a bit of a query with because uh, it's not necessarily negative when something feels uncomfortable. But uh, let's for the sake of simplicity just group them into uh, pleasant and unpleasant emotions, positive and negative. Yeah? So, we can tune into, for example, we can tune into gratitude at any moment in our lives. No matter what's happening, as long as you're breathing, you can be absolutely amazed that you're breathing. You know, I can channel an immense amount of gratitude just that I can stand on two legs and not fall over. It's, it's incredible when you think about all the processes that need to be in place in the human body for you to keep balance, you know, for you to breathe for your heart to pump blood into your brain. It's an incredible organ. The, the, the pure fact that we're able to think and are able to be self-aware, that we're able to think about ourselves and into the future and project into the future a better version of ourselves and then chase it, it's incredible. So any time, that's a really good reminder to just be grateful for that. You know? And then there's potentially a million other things that we can be grateful for. We can channel that at any moment and it's going to undo a range of negative emotions just like that, just by focusing on it. 
So that's pretty useful. Um, there's good research. Happy people are more productive, likable, active, healthy, friendly, helpful, resilient, and creative. And that's one study looking at a bunch of other studies. So there's uh, 20 years of research looking into what's right with people and what that actually leads to. So if you judge yourself as quite happy, you also found to be more of these. Oh, that's quite amazing. Uh, you experience more meaning in life when you're happier. There's good research in favor of applying strengths, working with character strength and gratitude and optimism and forgiveness and kindness and humor in coaching practice. Robert Biswasdina, um, I've show you, I'm going to show you his book later on. Uh, he was one of the first people who wrote about it academically. And it's really useful to draw in the evidence uh, from empirical research, which is what positive psychology really contributed as a science. Getting the empirical research done so that we can be reasonably confident that there's links. You know, not necessarily causal, but we can research that stuff. And that's really, really useful because now we can say, oh, wait, there's actually there's something there and we can prove it with numbers. You know, we can actually measure somebody, reliably measure somebody's level of likability or health or resilience or creativity. You know, some of these measures are more accurate than others. You know, we're still, we're still figuring stuff out. Uh, but we have 20, 30 years of good data. So happiness is pretty useful. Uh, we got to be a bit careful that we don't pressurize people as feeling too happy because the first wave of research came out and then there was this, uh, this, this wave of people that said, oh, but you have to be happy because it's so good for you. You're going to earn more money, you're going to have better relationships, you're going to be more productive, more creative. Why wouldn't you be happy? You know, just practice some gratitude. And then people who are actually feeling quite depressed at the moment, they will not have a good reaction to that. They're actually going to be more depressed when they're being faced with that kind of thing. It's like, just go for a walk in the woods and be mindful. It's going to be so good for you. It's like, but I can't even form a positive thought. You know, leave me alone. So again, I want to make that distinction. This is really, really useful, but it's not a panacea. But the research is there, and it suggests that there's powerful forces at work. Um, I think coaching is a fantastic framework to help people increase their levels of happiness to figure out what happiness actually means to them subjectively, you know, because there's many factors and some of them are going to be more important to you than others. So developing a language to do that and giving people the space not to be judged. You know, if somebody says, well, money is going to make me happy, you might know from the research that maybe money is just a means to an end and maybe money is not going to make you happy. But if somebody tells you that, as coaches, we have the skills not to say, no, that's not true. No, you're wrong. But as coaches, we have the skill to say, tell me more and exploring that. And then perhaps gently pointing out um, uh, in their narrative when something contradicts itself. Or perhaps like, oh, uh, can you tell me about a time when money made you really happy? And then you might arrive or that person might arrive at the conclusion it wasn't the money. It was the holiday that the money bought or the connections that the money bought or the freedom or the autonomy or the safety or the security. So. As coaches, we have that skill. That's why I think coaching is particularly important when we help people create more happiness. Traditionally, coaching was about performance, you know, and the paradigm was that more performance leads to more success, leads to more wealth. But does that lead to happiness? And many of you here, just because of the, of the ethos of animus, will know that's not really it. But if you've ever worked in an organization, you know that the coaching for performance paradigm is still very much alive and kicking. Uh, Sir John Whitmore wrote Coaching for Performance. That was the book about coaching since 1992 for a very long time. And it's still very much applied. So I think we're in a, in a quite a cool bubble and in a, in a um, wave of coaching that is going outside and beyond the coaching for performance paradigm and includes transformation and includes happiness and includes spiritual coaching or all of these other elements that go beyond mere performance. I think that's a really good development. But money, we now have, you know, we have data since 1930s. Uh, this goes to 2000 that shows uh, as happiness goes, as income goes up, happiness stays, stays relatively stable. You know, this is uh, GDP, happiness and life satisfaction. Again, GDP goes up and life satisfaction and happiness. Uh, this is in the US between 70s and uh, 2012, uh, stays pretty much stable. 
Here's happiness and GDP again, uh, up to 2016. A bit more fluctuation, but generally it stays pretty stable while uh, GDP is going up. So it's not the money. So if money doesn't make us happy, what does? And I've heard a lot of really good things already, but this is where we are in the midst of the theoretical foundation. The science of positive psychology looking at, okay, so what's right with people? How could we actually study it? Because up until 1999, when uh, Martin Seligman, then president of the, uh, of the American Psychological Association, he said, well, that's not being researched. We throw money at research when there's a problem and we fix problems and we go back to zero. There's a world between zero and plus 10 and we're not really researching it. We're not really looking at it scientifically. There's some evidence, but like we need to do much, much more of that. So he initiated that in only 1999. Um, there's various definitions of what it does. And uh, well, actually, before I go there, um, he said, well, this is a science. You know, uh, this is a science that's looking at what's right with people and um, what resources we can build on rather than uh, fixing what's wrong. We can build on what's already right. And it is a science, first and foremost. So we've always had a couple of students joining the positive psychology course. Um, uh, it's a master's of science. And then you have people that they want to study positive thinking and the secret, and there's a lot to it, but it's not scientific. And it's really useful to produce science. You know? And now there's actually, we can see why stuff like the secret and why positive affirmations, what, is, what are the elements of that that, that are working you know, beyond the marketing? You know, what are the elements that are actually working? What could we do more of? How could we draw that stuff into programs and interventions? But first and foremost, it's a science. We look at data, we gather data, we analyze it, and then we create theories on that. You know, and then we have hypotheses, we test them, and we falsify them, and if something's not falsifiable, it's not science. So that's really useful, and sometimes I think it's easy to forget, given that positive psychology has been rapidly growing and so popular that uh, many, many journalists would take a research finding that, oh, there's a correlation between chocolate and, uh, you know, happiness. And then it says, chocolate makes you happy, you know, and they get simplified. And there's, I mean, you know how often this kind of stuff works. Um, but at the core, it's a science, and I think that's important. Um, positive psychologists haven't reinvented the wheel. Uh, but l offering new perspectives on old ideas, offering that empirical data, so it gets a lot more sophisticated. Because the beautiful thing about science is that somebody in London can write up a research study and somebody in Botswana can read it. It all follows the same approach. It follows the same language. Um, it's, not, it's written in a way that it's uh, as precise as possible. That's why it's so horrible to read. Because you, know, you want to be precise with your language. You don't want to use emotional language. You don't want to tell stories because you know, they're, they're, they're subjective and they're individual. You want to gather data sets together and write in a language that everybody can read um, outside of the cultural context of where it's written. You know, that's why the language is so incredibly dry and not enjoyable to read, but so incredibly important. Because that's how science works. I can do a study here. Somebody in uh, Japan will replicate it because I wrote exactly how I'm doing stuff. And if they do exactly what I did and they get the same results, there's something there, potentially. You know, if 50 scientists do the same thing using the same method and they get the same results, we got some solid results. So just a word on science. Um, I'm a sucker for science. I really like the approach. It's certainly got limitations. Um, it's not everything, but it's really useful as a, as a piece of information that can help us create knowledge. Um, so Gable and Hyde looked at a bunch of different definitions of positive psychology. And they said positive psychology is the study of the conditions and processes that contribute to the flourishing uh, or optimal functioning of people, groups, and institutions. So not just individuals, also groups, also institutions, flourishing, and optimal functioning, the processes that contribute to it. It's the study of the conditions and processes. So there's a lot in there. If you just take a moment to take that in, they think hard, and uh, these definitions go through processes. Um, it's useful to just uh, keep in mind what we're actually talking about here. If we apply that kind of stuff, then 
you know, we can, uh, applied positive psychology is the application of the research so that we can facilitate optimal functioning. So here we bring the science in to help people be happier, basically, and perform better and function better. Um, that's important. Uh, there's two camps, generally, the ones that create the knowledge, the academics, with the dry language, and the people who apply the knowledge. That's the coaches, that's the practitioners, that's the teachers. And sometimes they're the same, and often they're different. But I think it's really useful for you, if you're not a scientist and you're already getting a bit bored by the science language, you know, you can use that stuff, but it's helpful to understand the foundations of where it's coming from so that you can keep being critical. Because people will throw evidence-based around as a term very, very loosely. And uh, there's, there's evidence that's stronger and there's evidence that is, I wouldn't really call evidence, but like if you want to have one case study and then you say that's evidence, technically I guess it's true and we can argue the case, but there's a scientific understanding of what evidence-based is. And then there's evidence-based as it's like to be used by people who want to sell programs. So it's useful uh, in science they teach you to uh, develop a critical approach. And I think it's useful for everybody to uh, approach things that are put out there as solutions critically. Just because there's no evidence in science doesn't mean it doesn't work for your client or it doesn't work for you. But it's useful to be aware of that, that just because it works for 10 people might not mean that it works for everybody. Just because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to work for my client. I'll just keep that in mind. Um, here's a couple of, uh, of the areas that positive psychologists look at and have studied. So character strengths, positive emotions, generally well-being and happiness and the theories, the pillars that are involved in it, what we're going to look at uh, today. Um, a lot of assessments and psychometrics, measurements came out of this, questionnaires, stuff that isn't uh, just 10 questions about like, oh, how much is this you? Um, but they go through a process, sometimes years, to come up with accurate psychometrics tests to really measure a specific construct. You know, uh, that can be really useful, particularly when you work in organizations or if you just want to help somebody measure their progress and monitor how much they've moved. You know, if a client comes in and says, I want to be happier, there's uh, a bunch of different well-being measures out there from 80 questions to one question. And you say, how happy are you? One to ten. You know, I, well, I'm a six. So how happy do you want to be? Well, I want to be at nine. Great. Then you have something to work with and they know they get the return on investment at the end. So it's really useful. Uh, positive psychology has uh, produced a lot of these um, psychometric tests and assessments. You might have heard of growth mindset, fixed mindset. You know, um, there's a lot we can do. That stuff that transforms whole people. You know, if they just switch, and sometimes it really happens quite suddenly that they all of a sudden see something from a completely different perspective, and they're like, whoa. Um, so that can really change a lot. Self-regulation, discipline, uh, one of the holy grails of psychology. Positive psychologists have looked at that. Engagement, motivation, flow states. Uh, so evidence-based interventions I mentioned, but also has a bunch of other things from creativity, wisdom, positive aging, uh, self-esteem and respect, uh, positive groups, organizations, hope, optimism. There's a huge area of research that positive psychologists look at. And uh, many of them are relevant for coaches, depending what kind of coach you are. So how to use coaching to increase happiness? I want to pause here for a second and just get you to think about what coaching is. Because there's a range of different definitions. Everybody seems to have their own. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance do I, can, I, can I have a, a show of hands? And don't worry, I won't call you out, but who has a sentence or two to describe what coaching is or what your coaching is? So like four or five out of where, 50? That tends to be my, uh, my experience. I've been asking that a lot at conferences and, and lecture halls. And 10% uh, is, uh, is much better than I usually see. Um, which is astonishing to me, you know, because we can all talk about it for a few minutes, right? And kind of tell somebody what coaching is and isn't. But to really think about what are the elements of coaching that makes it different, that makes it not therapy or not mentoring or not consulting. So this is something that I came across when I did my dissertation uh, back in the day. 
um, where you have the client as expert, you as the expert asking questions or giving answers, and he has coaching up there. A little bit overlap with facilitator, you know, far away, far away from a consultant, which is interesting because a lot of coaches, I think, are consultants, and a lot of consultants use coaching skills quite heavily. Um, therapist is quite up here asking questions, uh, but you're the expert. And I really hope that it's going to give a lot of people a bit of discomfort right now. Because <laughs> it certainly gave me some. Uh, I revised it a little bit. Um, and because I, I talk to a lot of coaches and I work with a lot of coaches, and it seems to be more like this. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, there is no regulation, which is the, uh, the beauty of an unregulated profession is you can do whatever you want and still call it coaching. And there will be coaches who will hate you for it because their coaching is here or their coaching is there and they really want to protect that space. And they say, if you talk about coaching as consulting, then that hurts my brand because if then I say I'm a coach, some people might think I'm a consultant and I'm not. You know, I'm a facilitator of learning. I'm not a trainer. I don't give advice. I don't make suggestions. You know, but if a coach comes to me and says, look, I." I am doing that quite regularly, and it's not so much about what I call it, but it's about what do I introduce it as. If somebody tells me, I'm a coach, and I'm going to give you lots of advice, I'm going to throw lots of suggestions at you, and uh, that might be a really helpful process. I just would like to know before we start. You know, so I don't spend money on something that I don't want. That's why the contracting is so incredibly important. You know, I stopped hating on all the terminology and when you're a science background, then it's really easy to get caught up in terminology. Uh, but really what's most important is that you frame it in the beginning and you tell people what it is and what it isn't. What I can and what I can't do for you. You know, and if you put it here, that's fine. If you put it here, that's fine. I mean, there's some, I have some issues with some of that stuff. I really disagree if somebody really does therapy work. I had, a I had somebody uh, in a training who said, um, I worked with a, with a coach, with a life coach, uh, who helped me through my trauma of, uh, of thinking I should have not existed. And we went right into my childhood in the first session and we, uh, you know, reprocessed everything. And I'm like, that, that's therapy. But it helped immensely. That coach did fantastic work. I think they should have called themselves a therapist. But maybe there's a regulation thing, you know, uh, I don't know, I think it was in America. So, uh, but like, fair play. Um, I think coaching can be anything because it's unregulated, but please tell your clients what you do and what you don't do, you know, so they can make an informed decision. Then it's ethical, you know, that's the beauty of an unregulated profession. But don't assume that people know what you mean when you say coach because they might think you're a consultant or your manager or your mentor or your professional friend. I think this is helpful just to kind of as a concept of thinking about the coaching space. Uh, my natural hair area is probably here in confronting and exploring, but sometimes I sit there and I support. Sometimes I give a lot of advice depending on what we contracted together. So I, I think a good coach, they might move all over the place depending on what's necessary, what's appropriate and what's most needed. But it's completely fine if you say, I never give advice. You know, but it's useful to kind of think about this. This is from Dehan. So who you are is how you coach, is what I often tell students, you know. And I'm making these points because I think it's important that uh, you can use positive psychology and you can facilitate happiness and well-being no matter what kind of coach you are. You might be super telly and 50 years of teaching experience have just made you into a person with lots of good advice and you have read all the literature and you have lots of good interventions and you give homework. You know, that's gonna facilitate well-being. I'm not sure if you're a coach in my eyes, but it really doesn't matter that much. So anybody can, anybody, no matter of your style, anybody can facilitate well-being, but only if you understand what happiness actually is. So what is it? We've had a few things flown around. Uh, an early concept was satisfaction with life. So. Very simple, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your life? The, I put a letter there because uh, at Dina, the research in the 80s, they actually went around the world and asked people that question with a picture of a letter and said, if you were on top of the letter, your life would be close to ideal. And if you have the bottom of the letter, you're really not satisfied with it at all. That gives you a really valid measure of how satisfied somebody is with their life. You know, and you can compare that among different countries. That's how these uh, studies come across. 
uh, come up of who's the happiest country. And it's meaningful, and it's valid, and it's useful. It doesn't really capture happiness, right? I just wanted to say this is a very simple, these are the five questions that they, that they used beyond the ladder in a different study. In most ways, my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I'm satisfied with my life. And so far, I've gotten the important things I want in life. And if, you could live my life, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. They capture something, right? But there's more to happiness. So <laughs> unless somebody vehemently agrees, they're like, no, that's it. That's totally it. That's exactly what I mean when I say I want to be happy. You know, I, would, I would definitely want all of that. But I think there's more to it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so subjective well-being. Um, Dina said, well, that satisfaction with life, what we've just talked about, plus positive affect, good feelings, in simple terms, minus negative affect, minus uncomfortable feelings. Again, goes a little bit further. It's like it brings that kind of feeling element in, because here there's not really any immediate emotional states involved. It's just a general satisfaction with life. So here we're introducing emotions, which I think is really important. You know, because you can be generally quite satisfied with all of the conditions in your life, but still you feel a bit depressed. So it adds another element to it. So there's generally two different areas of happiness. Hedonism, feeling good, and eudaimonia, living a life of meaning, being very satisfied, living in accordance with your values. You mentioned authenticity, you know. Um, Transcendence, personal development, reaching long-term goals. They're not really captured in hedonism. But either one or the other is not really complete. I mean, I, I've had very long conversation with, uh, with a pure hedonist. It was a very, very long time ago. And I was amazed because that person was basically saying, well, I'm going to do all the drugs. I'm going to drink all day. And like, I'm going to party very, very hard. And if I die with 30, that's fine. And I'm like, whoa, that's, that's going against a lot of things that I believe in. Uh, but I, like, I, I questioned it. And I, in the end, I had to respect that this person's going to live their life that way. You know, I do think that they probably would regret it at some point when they wanted to live a little bit longer and they just destroyed their body and their mind. But at that point, if somebody makes that decision, it's like, huh. Yeah, I can see why you call yourself happy, perhaps much happier than somebody who works very hard at a job at the moment for a positive outcome in 10 years' time. But, you know, there's two elements. I can't really say that somebody is happier than the other person, because if you live a life of meaning, but every day you're working really hard, but you go to bed with a smile because you know you're doing the right thing with your life, you know, it's a very different way of being in the world. But both could call themselves happy. So if somebody comes to you and says, I want to be happier, think about what that means. Which, which part is it? Self-determination theory is uh, this has been quite a major step. It's a theory of motivation, essentially. Um, but it, uh, it identified three major factors that contribute to well-being, which are autonomy, which we already mentioned, the ability to do what you want to a large degree. It's competence, being able to have the skills to deal with whatever your environment is. We need a different set of skills, for example, to live in, uh, in Soho, London, than we need in the Amazonian jungle hunting for food. You know, you need weapons and uh, a different skill set for hunting food or plants than you hunt for money in Soho. You know, it's a very different skill set. So, but if you don't have the skills to deal with your environment, then that's going to impact your motivation and your well-being. And relatedness, biggie, you know, the relationships we have with other people. Has been shown as uh, one of the most important factors in somebody's well-being. We're social animals. We connect, you know, and it doesn't matter if we love many, many friends or just have a very few that we're really, really close with. You know, it's not the quantity of our relationships, it's the quality of our relationships. So when I'm coaching in the beginning, I would always um, get a sense for somebody's social world, you know, somebody's connection with other people. 
You know, it doesn't have to be, the, they can never speak to their family, but have the most amazing friends. They don't need to have kids to have a lot of positive relationships in their life where people learn from them. You know, they don't need lots of friends and go out all the time. You can be a super introvert and spend most of your time on your own, but once a month you see your best friend and you talk for eight hours, you know? That's, that's the same level, the same quality of positive relationships because that's, again, it's subjective. Really useful. So here you see the positive relationships. This is my, probably my favorite uh, theory of well-being. Here you see positive relationships, autonomy, and environmental mastery, uh, which is more or less competence. You have three more, self-acceptance, which I'm sure a lot of you will have seen in the coaching room as one of the major issues or obstacles to, to happiness. A sense of personal growth means change, movement, you know, um, going Feeling like you're going forward, you're getting bigger, and getting bigger might mean earning less money doing something more meaningful. You know, it might mean having less friends, but better relationships with them. You know, so growth is not the kind of capitalistic, we always have to grow until we burst, even, you know, if the, that's not growth. Growth means that you have a personal sense of movement, of change, and purpose, purpose in life, a sense that you're living a meaningful existence. This is Martin Seligman's PERMA, probably now the most popular uh, theory of well-being, um, which again has uh, a lot of the areas already that we've, that we've seen. Positive emotions, feeling good. Um, we have seen relationships. We've seen meaning. Achievement, a sense of accomplishment. That's interesting because it's kind of linked to growth as well, but it makes it very visible why people work, why people chase goals. You know, why does it feel so good when we have a to-do list and we tick stuff off? You know, if we set a year-long goal and then we reach it, that gives us a real sense of achievement. That, that movie was Will Smith, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness. I was so mad at that movie. And, uh, sorry, spoiler, spoilers ahead. <laughs> has, anybody, has anybody not seen it? Is it okay if I spoil it a little? It culminates, it culminates uh, in that moment when he achieves what he set out to do. And he said, that, that's happiness. That moment. And I'm like, no, it's not a moment. It's so much more. But that is arguably a really important aspect of happiness. That's why so many people, they, they come to a coach, they set a goal, they achieve it, they feel really good. You know, and then they adapt to it because that's what we people do. You know, it's a blessing and a curse. We adapt to uh, good things and bad things. You know, it's really useful or really annoying because we achieve a goal and then we adapt to it and then we need another goal. So we can keep going like that for a while, but it arguably makes us happy if every day we set a goal for that evening and then we reach it. It's a fantastic existence. It's just you need to keep setting goals, which can get a bit exhausting. But it's there. Um, and engagement, finding flow, you know, being, being involved in your life. That's one of the factors that has, been, um, that has been shown to have the most impact on longevity. You know, people who are engaged in life, they live longer. And that's, that's quite fantastic. And there's a lot of things we can do to increase our level of engagement. Somebody then added a silent H for health, because that's the one that kept coming up. Physical health, vitality, it's really important. Without that, it's really difficult to be happy, you know? And, uh, Partly it's incompetence, you know, in that environmental mastery, because if you don't have the physical ability to do stuff, it really will act on your skill set to deal with your environment. But that's really, really useful to know. And this one got recently out, uh, only 2016. Um, you might have seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is kind of, by the way, Maslow never talked about a pyramid that cannot be found in any of his literature, fun fact. Um, but it starts with survival skills, you know, that, that health aspect, you know. If you're not surviving, you, it's difficult to be happy. Um, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel secure, it's difficult to be happy, you know. Then next stage would be, again, life improvement. You need some skills for that, you know. And uh, this theory outlines certain sets of skills, which makes it really useful for coaching. Because you can learn life improvement skills, you know. You can learn self-development skills. You can learn social skills, and you can learn work skills. So this is all learnable, and as coaches, we can help people to develop it. So really useful to kind of, uh, if we put that up for a client and say, hey, um, 
what's going right in your life? You know, if you look at that, and uh, how, how are you on these? You could even have them score them one to 10, or just have a conversation around it if you don't like scoring or working with, with tools or assessment. You, could, you don't need to show this. The, the way that in coaching it often works, uh, at least for me, is I look at this, I go into a practice room with a triad, and it is really clunky, and I keep looking at my cheat sheet, and then at some point you internalize these questions, and you make a mental note. And at some point, it feels like a normal conversation that you're having, but really you are assessing people um, against a model of well-being. And if somebody comes to you and says, I don't feel good, or I want to be happier, or I'm not so satisfied with my life, I want to change something, you have the language and the models in your head to have that conversation, which then feels like a normal conversation, but actually you're doing a lot of work. And having these things in your mind can can help you be aware of what, what, I am, what are you not telling me? What am I not hearing? You know, if you think about this stuff in those breaks or in the back of your mind, I have, I have to, I've had a client who told me a bunch of things about his emotional states and what he was thinking and like his uh, spiritual angle and his belief system, but I had never heard him say anything about other people. You know, I, I think at, at once I mentioned in passing, he mentioned he had a wife. But like we were talking for 45 minutes and I had not heard anything about other people. So that made me curious. Not that they had bad relationships, but it makes me curious. So it opens an angle for inquiry for you as a coach. So let's revisit that. Um, I tried to capture as many as possible. I really like that balance thing, Carl. Um, I, I, I'm not sure where I put that in, but um, I, think, I think there might be that they might be up, up to something. <laughs> um, is there something that you don't see here? Something that you've talked about in the beginning that clients come to you for, or that you want yourself, or that you would want for your loved ones? Is there something that isn't quite captured, or where we could, where we could make a connection, perhaps? Yes, please. It's got some, some, kind of, some, some kind of unmet need. Some kind of unmet need. Yeah. Could, could you give me an example? example? So it could be, for example, to do with, I don't know, a relationship. Uh-huh. Um, but I wouldn't, I guess in my mind, I would make that connection automatically now. And this is more about, you know, meeting that need, mm -hmm. which then leads to a sense of fulfillment. It's not necessarily happened. Yeah, and that, that need that tells me, well, there could be an achievement that they want to be met, or like a sense of growth, something that they're not having. It could be one of those needs to survive or feel secure or feel connected. You know, so I think a lot of them are connected to needs and that's where we can get really curious about what that need is and how it's connected. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, possibly the positive emotion character has to be we were talking about self-love. Self-love. When you see self-acceptance, which I didn't put here. Great. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, self-love is so much more than self-acceptance, but I think there is no self-love without self-acceptance, right? And what, what's that quote about uh, if you fall in love with yourself, it's the start of the most wonderful lifelong love relationship or something? Uh, so I think relationships go beyond relationships with other people. It's also the relationship with yourself. You know, so if you can develop actual love, you know, there's gratitude in there, there's kindness in there, you know, there's self-acceptance in there, very, very meaningful, you know, if you allow that to happen. So yeah, I, I love that. Um, there's another saying that you're only as happy as your least happy child. So, mm -hmm. and actually oh, the happiness yeah. of the people uh, close to you directly impacts your own uh -huh. personal happiness. Yeah, you're only as happy as your least happy child. Yeah. yeah, relationships, right? And there is no closer relationship than the one to your kids. You know, I think, I don't have kids yet. You know, I'm thinking about them a lot now. So it's as if they were almost there because they're already influencing me. But like I've seen a lot change in my life. Just not when kids stop becoming an intellectual concept of yes, that's gonna happen at some point to I can picture them, 
because I can see the partner and I can see uh, what an integration of us two would look like if they get raised. It's like, oh my God, the, the energy that that releases is both exciting and extremely scary. <laughs> <laughs> But talking about achievement, it really helped me a lot. <laughs> um, kids, there's so much. By the way, uh, kids statistically don't make you happier. <laughs> they have intense moments of joy where uh, there's nothing happier in the whole world, but you also worry a lot, you know? So statistically, on average, it actually balances out. <laughs> but that's where the numbers get a bit uh, too numbery. Um, because kids, meaning relationships, autonomy, ooh, a big impact on autonomy. Uh, growth, for sure. Um, achievement, every day, I guess. Safety, again, something you will be constantly worried about. Um, but if your kids grow older, at some point they can take care of you. Uh, if you've, you know, I mean, some people fall out and it's really, um, it's really sad. But a lot of times kids will take care of their parents up into old age. You know, that sense of security and safety, that's like having that family around you, it's, in, it's intense. Um, I'm, I've, I've married into a Mexican family and the relationships, the, the structures are incredible. I can see how, how, how the family is this integral part to a Latin American person, you know, and they just give you so much. It's like, I mean, I'm German and like I see if I don't talk to my mom for two or three weeks, it's fine. I, I hope to I like to believe that it's fine for her also. <laughs> but like certainly she's not calling me 15 times if she can't get a hold of me in the 10 minutes. And I get I get called by my wife's mom a lot more than by my mom. <laughs> and usually because she wants to talk to her because, you know, she couldn't reach her for five minutes or so. And because she was just doing some stuff. So. But the, the, the sense of belonging that you get is fantastic. It's so valuable. And I think it, it really impacts on, on uh, somebody's happiness. Uh, they teach you stuff, you know. Um, you're engaged, you're very engaged when you have kids. You know, you're going to be super in the zone a lot of your days. You know, just like part of it is just a pure exhaustion, I think. And you just don't have any mindset left for anything else. But like, if you start playing with a kid, you get lost. You don't think about work. You know, if they start asking you questions and you explain the world to a toddler, you know, that's, you're not going to think about anything else. You're going to be so in the zone and only doing that. And there's good research that that is really affecting your levels of well-being quite, quite significantly. Not while you're in flow, but when you come out of it. You know, it's a wonderful state to come out of. Because <laughs> in the state, you don't really feel anything. You're not really aware of anything. Okay, so what does it look like in practice? Um, Cool, excellent. There's no tested models, there's you no know, unified theory, there's no rules, and there's very few guidelines in academia. So um, I've been teaching on the, on the masters in applied positive psychology and coaching psychology. It's not a masters in positive psychology coaching because nobody really knows what that is yet. You know, there are some books, and uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about some of them later, uh, there's some models, but science moves relatively slowly. And given that coaching is different depending on who you are as a coach, then given that it's so unregulated, it's really difficult to study it. Because w what has helped right now is that the series of questions you were asking, or the homework you were giving, or the intervention that you've done, or is it the relationship that you as a unique human being had with that unique human being in front of you? You know, because I, I'm a relationship first kind of coach. You know, uh, Dehan's relational coaching is featured here. And I, I, I think and I also know from the science that exists, the relationship is the, the main driving factor, not just in therapy, but also in coaching. You know, you can do fantastic work not having a particularly good relationship. You know, it works, there's valuable. But if you have the relationship and nothing else, it's already valuable. You know, people already being moved just because they connected in an authentic way with another human being and they've listened. You know, you don't have to do anything if you're just being with somebody for six sessions and you just show up as a human being and you're interested in them. That can really move people. So that, that's the essence. But then on top of that, there's a bunch of things we can do. Lots of interventions, uh, processes, you know, grow, toolkit. All of these are series of questions and taking somebody through a process. 
Coaching is a managed conversation. You know, that's part of what I believe coaching is. You know, you, you take somebody through a process depending on what they came for. And there's lots of really good processes. So if you get the relationship right, then you can introduce a lot of positive psychology knowledge into your coaching in many different ways. But because it's so dependent on the relationship, it's hard to study. So we'll need a few more decades to really have something emerge. You know, there's really good processes and some of them I want to introduce, um, but they're all possibilities. So I, what, I, what I do when I teach positive psychology for coaches, which is not positive psychology coaching, is I want to teach you about positive psychology so that you can take what you think will work for you and integrate it into the way that you already coach. Yeah, make sense? So, this was Dina, I mentioned Robert uh, earlier. Um, really good positive psychology, uh, practicing positive psychology coaching. He says, well, you're working with strength, you're working with assessment, and you're harnessing positivity. So you bring a really positive vibe, you know, you, bring, you create a positivity atmosphere, you know, and that might be a strategic joke you crack at the beginning, you know, um, because you're invoking positive emotions. And we had that in the beginning, start questioning in a way that people are in a positive mood and they're gonna be more creative. You know, uh, you can use assessments to monitor people's progress. Assessments are a really good way to open up a conversation about who they, who they are. Do a strength assessment with somebody and you'll find out what their values are in the conversation that follows. You know, and there's lots of free tests out there and um, I put them in the, in the resource section as well. Um, so he's working a lot with uh, strength. Um, and a lot of coaches actually do with strength. I know of a few coaches who always, would always start the first session with a strength assessment. Because strengths are so linked to values and to beliefs and what you're naturally good at. And the, the theory is quite solid that if we do something we're naturally good at, then you know, we're more productive, we're actually gonna enjoy work because work is not so much perceived as work anymore because we're already really good at it. So many people are in jobs where they're not using their strengths. And then perhaps they can use their strengths in a different way, doing the things differently in their job if they have that movement. Sometimes people leave their jobs because they realize, actually other things I enjoy so much more. Ask people about their hobbies. Ask people about the things where money doesn't motivate them and you'll probably find out what their strengths are. You know, because if it's something that is naturally enjoyable and you do it for intrinsic motivation, not because of an external reason, you know, you're gonna get to somewhere really valuable. Because if they can do more of that, or if they could even monetize it, and then create the security or buy more of the conditions and processes that create more happiness. You know, it's a really good entry point, so that's why it's in this model. And positive interventions. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, what's out there, evidence-based. Um, but if you just Google positive interventions or positive psychology interventions, you'll come to a multitude of stuff that you can actually do. You know, and have you like if somebody wants to get into mindfulness, there's uh, there's evidence-based mindfulness programs out there. There's a lot of crap, and there's a lot of really good programs. You know, um, it's like yoga. Like some yoga is the real deal, and some yoga is just basically stretch aerobics. You know, um, I saw a gin tonic yoga session. <laughs> I mean, it sounds appealing, <laughs> but uh, I don't think it has much to do with yoga as such as it would be practiced um, where it came from. What's that? <laughs> well, you get quite mindful after the right amount of glasses. <laughs> um, so the bi five basic tenets of uh, positive psychology coaching uh, under Biswas Dina is humans have an innate drive to grow. You know, innate drive to grow, to change, to overcome. That's in us. When we're born, we explore the world. You know, yes, toddlers can get scared, but usually they've learned that. They've learned to get scared. You don't see a baby that doesn't crawl everywhere. You know, and I've, my brother has two kids now, and like this, this, this little man, once he started walking, would just, you would stand him on the table and he would just start running. It's like, but there's an abyss. <laughs> Don't you see the abyss? And I was like, oh, I wonder what it's like to fall down the abyss. Hmm. <laughs> you know, we have that innate drive to learn and then we unlearn it with time, which is really sad to me. But like in coaching, it's really useful to re reactivate that or explore what kept people, uh, what hold them back 
from learning. Usually it's some sort of getting hurt in the past. They don't want to do it anymore. You know, it's like, oh, I, I, stopped, I stopped falling in love because it's too painful. You know, you can actually stop yourself from living a really good life. You know, I'm not going to open myself up and make myself vulnerable anymore because I'm going to get hurt. If I've learned that, I can shut myself down. You know, I'm not going to get all the benefits from positive relationships, but I'm also not going to get hurt. You know, what kind of life you want to live, I think that's a choice. But we have that innate drive in us to test boundaries and limits. At some point, we can choose to not do that anymore and live rather flat, but safe. Focusing on strength is a powerful or more powerful, is as powerful or more powerful than focusing on weaknesses to achieve success. Not saying you should never talk about any weaknesses or any mistakes you've made or uh, anything that you're not good at to improve it. You know, it's really useful to improve some things that you need, talking about life skills, for example, or survival skills, or any of the skills in the survive and thrive theory. Uh, we can learn those skills and it's useful, but Focusing on what you're already good at and doing that more or differently is as or more powerful. And there's good research on that now. Uh, Ryan Nemec is uh, one of is the, the main guy in strength theory and uh, it just released a book on interventions. I really recommend it. Um, positivity, whether in the form of emotions or hope, is a powerful resource for facilitating change and achieving success. And you know that when a client comes to you, that sense of investing in yourself to work with a coach, that sense of hope that your life will change or at least has the potential to change. If you instill that kind of hope in somebody just by believing in them, you don't need to know whether they're guaranteed to get the outcome that they came for. But if they feel the hope that there's potential and you exude that atmosphere of, I think you can do anything, you know, or I think you can do this that you came here for. You know, I'm not necessarily a fan of anybody can do anything they want because I think there's limits to what human beings can achieve depending on all sorts of different factors. But if somebody comes to me, my consultations are quite long because I want to dig into what they're here for and who they are. And if I believe that they can achieve what they want and what they came for, which very, most of the time I do believe because most of the time it's not out of the ballpark, you know, it's not unrealistic. You know, if somebody really wants to make a million or five, I think they can if they really apply themselves. Question is, what, do they, what are they willing to sacrifice? But I believe in the potential. And I think that's a very, very powerful thing to give them that kind of hope. Be real, but exude that energy and people will pick up on it. That's part of positive psychology coaching as described here. Pay attention to both positive and negative aspects. You know, you need to pay attention to both. You can't just ignore the negative. Um, there's this sales nutter called Grant Cardone that I've actually learned quite a bit from, but he's also crazy. Um, <laughs> I can recommend it with a kilo of salt, but uh, look into some of this stuff. Uh, it really, it's really interesting. But like he has a sign in his office that says, no, no negativity allowed, can do attitude. And that has a seductive vibe to it. You know, if somebody comes to you and is like, you can do absolutely, I do anything for you, it's not a problem, we'll sort it out. You know, it's very attractive. But if somebody comes to you for coaching, it's nicer to only coach the positives, but actually we need to pay attention to both. You know, we need some balance. <laughs> oh, every time I'm gonna say balance, I'm gonna look at Carl now. <laughs> Carl, you're the balance guy from now on. Um, very important, it's scientifically derived knowledge and assessments. They give us a unique ways of understanding clients and coaching. So a positive psychology coach, in my opinion, should always be informed by science and keep up to date with the science. You know, there's so much that changes. There's a, um, there's a theory called the, um, the three to one positivity ratio. Um, was based, long story short, it was based on not good science. You know, uh, there was a data set and there was something dodgy happening. It wasn't analyzed right or maybe something else, but like it got debunked thoroughly, you know, it, it sh but it's still being taught because it's so simple and it's so uh, simplicity is attractive, you know, but like things change in science and that's a good thing. You know, uh, you, you don't try to protect and hold on to knowledge just because it's simple and nice and it works for you. You know, that's not how science works. 
So there's actually good ways, and one of them I mentioned later, of actually keeping up to date with the science. If you read an abstract, which is 150, 200 words, um, you get all the knowledge from a scientific article that could be 10 or 20 or 100 pages long. You know, so it's, you can actually get through new knowledge quite quickly if you start to read it into a little bit and you bear a little bit of the dry language. You know, there's also good blog posts. Uh, PositivePsychology.com, my friend uh, Seth Fontaine Pennock. Uh, really, really good blog. Um, I put the link in the back as well. Um, he, he's got good writers. You know, I trust the platform of doing good writing. There are people, they are informed. You know, so if you know your sources, then you can actually filter out the good science and leave the crap in the Daily Mail behind. <laughs> that said, a uh, good colleague of mine, Tim Lomas, uh, had an article in the Daily Mail about his book, and it was a decent article. So, uh, <laughs> um, oh yeah, I mentioned positivepsychology.com. Um, here's how it could look like if you were to structure it, because I know there's at least some of you will be quite keen on a very structured process. I'm very big picture, I'm very open, and I like that space because you just allow what happens to happen and then you work with it. Um, but also it takes, it's very complicated, it's a very complex process. And sometimes you just only have a few sessions, you know, or there's a limited budget, or maybe you just like structured approaches, or maybe your client loves to know what's gonna happen to them. This is amazing. Get your client info and contact details. Session one, explore values and set goals. There's a bunch of exercises you can use for that. You know, then explore their strengths. Have them do a strength uh, assessment between session one and session two. Come in, talk about it. Find out what their values are, what their strengths are, what they, how they could work with it, what they're already doing. You know, um, in relation to the goal, obviously, always. Session three, behavioral change. Lots of different ways that we can very actively change behavior in order to change thoughts and emotions. You know, it's a really, there's, there's so much out there that we can use, not necessarily from positive psychology, everything, because behavior change has been a thing for forever, uh, but a lot of data has come through positive psychology about certain interventions. You know, then what are the obstacles? How could you cope with them? How could you work through them? You know, work on positive emotions. How can you build them into the process? And then you evaluate what's happened and how far you've moved, and you talk about how you could maintain those changes in the future. You know, I, it gives me the creeps to look at that and imagine me working like that. <laughs> but I'm sure there's a bunch of you in there that's like, oh yeah, this is really good. I could see myself doing that. You know, and there's, there's more info on that, but I think it's part of their, their paid program. But I, I, I wanted to put it out there just as an example of, yes, it could also be very structured. Possible applications techniques. You can, if you just listen to well-being, and I do that in, uh, in my trainings a lot, it's just like, Listen to somebody for four or five minutes talk about anything and you start listening to what makes them happy. You can, you can read it between the lines or very often it's very obvious. You know, what do they enjoy? If you ask a specific questions, tell me about a time when your life was awesome. You know, tell me about a time when you felt really engaged in life. Then they start telling you a lot of stuff and you can start listening to all of these elements and pillars that we've heard across the different theories. You know, and then maybe you start being really curious about some of them or clarifying, use your coaching skills. But uh, that's really useful, just start learning to listen to well-being. You can do that when you watch TV, you know, or when you watch a movie, or when you listen to anybody talk. Just try to spot over the next week what elements of well-being come up Lettering goals, I mentioned that earlier. If you had that promotion, what would it give you? You know, oh, I could buy the car. If you had the car, what would it give you? Oh, like uh, that neighbor would finally talk to me about cars. Uh, ah, what would that give you? Oh, a sense of connection or a sense of uh, self-worth or like a sense of security or whatever might come out of it. Letter, find out what the ultimate goal is. Again, you can do that uh, in pairs. You can do that in the next triad. Uh, I recommend getting practice clients, no matter if you've been coaching for years. You know, I always have a few clients, uh, I try to have at least one uh, ongoing that I work with for very little and say, oh, I'm going to experiment with some stuff. You know, um, you can always do that and I think it's useful. Try this kind of stuff out or just in the next coaching training. Working with strength, um, strength spotting, uh, strength interview. Tell me about a time you were at your best. You know, tell me about a time when you've achieved something that you were really proud of. You know, and then 
listen to the story. You know, there's a bunch of questions around that that you can ask, but you're going to hear about somebody's strengths. And we don't have time to get into uh, the whole strengths model and what the different strengths are and the research behind it, but like, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. Coaching for flow and engagement. There's, uh, there's nine conditions for flow um, following uh, Mihai Chiksent Mihai, and I'd love to have somebody just try to spell that. <laughs> um, learn, um, uh, there's nine conditions and you can have coaching conversations to create them. You know, the main one is a balance of skills and challenge. You know, if you have a lot of skills, you need a high challenge in order to not be bored. You know, if you have a high challenge, you need high skills in order not to be anxious. So if you have that balance, you're in the flow channel. And if you have that balance, it's much more likely you're gonna be engaged. Not bored, not anxious, but engaged. There's a lot of other uh, factors that play into getting into flow or increasing engagement. So there's a lot we can do through coaching to raise those levels. Learned optimism, we can actually learn to be more optimistic. And optimistic not necessarily as, um, I always have the best outlook on the future. You know, it's gonna be fine and everybody's gonna be all right. But uh, the dispositional optimism uh, that's coming from Seligman and Peterson, who said, being positive about what's happened in the past and what's happening now. How do we make sense of things? You know, if I failed an exam, I might say, oh, I'm an idiot and I'm stupid and I'm never gonna be anything and I'm always gonna fail math. You know, just in no good. You could also say, well, that exam was pretty hard. Uh, actually, it was the teacher who doesn't like me and gave me one that was particularly hard. And I could also say, well, I might not be good at math, but you know, I'm really good at English and sports and uh, other stuff, you know? So I can kind of explain something that is bad or negative in a positive way. You know, there's also downsides to that because for example, if something really good happens, somebody might say, oh, that was just luck instead of I did this. I can be really proud of this. So again, there's not one of those that is uh, always preferable, uh, but we can work with that kind of stuff. You know, and as a coach, we can ask very specific questions. What was your part in that achievement? You know, if somebody's very pessimistic about their achievements, about positive things, you know? Sounds like you made that happen. You know, what, 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 what does your family say about that? Oh, they're all super proud. It's like, oh, you think you have a reason to be proud? You know, so there's lots of ways that we can uh, work with learned optimism in explanatory style. And sometimes it's the positive thinking but that has a lot of other connotations, which again, for a scientist is like, mm, because it's not just about thinking positive, you know, uh, that can actually be really, really detrimental. But what we want to do is develop an explanatory style that could be counted or constructive thinking, you know, there's a lot of uh, cognitive behavioral stuff. We can work a lot with our thoughts. You know, you could call that positive thinking, but not in the way that maybe uh, L or Cosmopolitan would do. But in science, you would, have other terminology, there's a large overlap. You know, that's why a lot of that stuff really, really works. But finding out why exactly that works, that's where we get into when we, when we look at that stuff in more depth. Lots of interventions, homework. You know, there's so much that has been generated uh, by positive psychologists to say, you can do this in a structured way, I can give you a sheet of paper and you can be happier. You know, uh, instructions on how to do it and what the process is so that you can raise your levels of well-being. Um, Post-traumatic growth, mindsets we talked about, lots of measurement tools we talked about. Um, that positive existential mindset embracing challenge and anxiety as something that makes life worth living. You know, there's uh, a lot we can talk about that we can start challenging. So there's more to positive psychology than just working with what's pleasant and nice. We can learn resilient skills. Mindfulness and meditation is a big part of the research in positive psychology. I know the, the CPD at Animus is, is quite, uh, this comes probably up most often when I work with clients, particularly very high stress clients, you know, very successful, very, lots of pressure on them. You know, um, being in charge of where your attention goes is probably the most important skill that we can learn in our lives. You know, that solves so many things and we can learn it through getting, building meditation habits. 
You have a couple of interventions. Um, we don't have that much time. Uh, if you want more of these, uh, come to the training because I'm, I'm going to go through each of these in details. Um, expressing gratitude. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Be kind. Random acts of kindness. You know, so many things we can do. Write. Start journaling. It's brilliant. You know, not everybody's thing, but like it really works. There's a lot of research. Get into an exercise habit. You know, there's uh, an ideal self exercise. Uh, what? Who could I be in the future? Write yourself a letter from future you, having built the almost ideal life. You know, write your obituary and what all the people would talk about. You know, when you when you have died or when you're close to your death. Imagine you're on your deathbed and looking back at your life, having lived it really well. You know, what comes up for you? This can really give you a lot of insight into how you want to live and what's important to you. Um, these are the two books on, uh, I gotta pitch mine obviously. <laughs> these are the two books, that Leben ist kein Ponyhof uh, is what my, what my, uh, my grandma often said. Um, there's some Germans here <laughs> judging by their laughter. Uh, life is not a, is not a um, pony, pony, how would you translate it? Like a pony farm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Life's not a pony farm. It's not always nice. Um, you know, it's pretty hard and tough. And uh, uh, my colleagues from UEL, or former colleagues, uh, have acknowledged that and looking at the other side of human existence. And existential coaching, the way that I see it, is inherently positive. And a lot of the second wave of positive psychology includes these existential elements. So I think that's really important that we don't ignore all of what's difficult and challenging about life. And we can learn, I know we can learn to embrace it as the stuff that makes life worth living. You know, because the, the stories that people tell, that they're proud of, they're usually about overcoming challenge. You know, beating anxiety, having, having a huge obstacle in front of them and going through it, overcoming it. You know, the, the dark periods in our lives are usually the stuff that we tell with a sense of ownership and we took responsibility for our lives and we went through it and we kept going and we achieved and we had success. You know, there's no movie where everything, yeah, maybe there is some, but like, there's no movie that I would enjoy watching <laughs> that's just nice. <laughs> you know, we need some story arc and we need somebody who's, who's dealing with death or decisions, dilemmas or paradox or difficult relationships. So in conclusion, everybody is chasing some form of happiness. And uh, if, you, if you still don't quite on that, please do talk to me because I'm, I'm quite open about that and I would really like to be challenged. Um, so that, that would be amazing if you, if you think like, nah, I don't think, I don't think there's, yeah, anyway, talk to me. Um, <laughs> everybody's chasing some form of happiness uh, is the point that I wanted to make. Uh, according to all of these theories, um, happiness is more than just positive emotions. Happiness has many facets and many pillars. Happiness is subjective, you know, to some, some things are more important than the other pillars. Coaches have many ways to facilitate happiness and increase well-being regardless of your style. Happiness coaching can work across that variety, you know, and there's so many processes, interventions, so many things that we can use and build into the way that we coach. And happiness doesn't mean you're always feeling good. So here are a couple of resources. I won't talk you through them. Uh, check them out. I'll uh, put the, the slides going to be in a presentation. I'll make it downloadable and redistribute it. Uh, these are the couple of the books. There's not many books. Uh, this one you can download on the Animus uh, site that I've written. Um, and this is the new, the new one came out this year. It's fantastic. It gives you a huge overview of about a lot of stuff. I mentioned positive uh, Mr. Dina's book. And uh, these two are also full of good ideas. Um, but these are actually all the books that are written about positive psychology coaching. There are no others. Mm -hmm. um, that's the course. And I think uh, Zoe has a few things to say about that. But like, if you want to dive into more depth, I'm doing two days in August. And it uh, would be amazing to see you there if you wanted uh, to learn more and dive deeper. We have two days where we try some of that stuff out, take it for a spin, try it, and go into a lot more depth on some of the, the stuff that we didn't have time for today. And now talk to each other. Um, through supervision, reflection, conversation, we learn. Coaching is a conversation. So I'm going to be at the bar. Uh, the more we talk to each other, <laughs> the longer we talk to each other, the more interesting conversations we have. 
And if you want to talk to me after that, because you might need to uh, see your kids and be a bit anxious <laughs> or extremely happy, uh, you can talk to me anytime you want. My doors are almost always open, I often say. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.